because the university is a very contradictory kind of place. It's a place that is both committed to scholarship and to not rocking the boat. Uh, now, the different universities are connected to the largest system in different ways. That roughly, we used to say that MIT teaches you how to kill people and Harvard teaches you who to kill. <laughs> uh, well, the community colleges train people to be intermediate level workers in the knowledge industry. Uh, so there's a channeling because the country doesn't need uh, hundreds of thousands of rulers. So the, the elite universities channel, channel people. Very often they come from families who are already embedded in the, in the ruling strata, like the Kennedys and the Bushes. Sometimes not. Sometimes people manage to crash into that circle, and they learn pretty quickly what's acceptable, what's respectable, what do you need to do in order to be recognized. So now this has certain kinds of consequences for the development of policy over the last few generations. If we look over the, uh, the outcomes of various international programs, we see, first of all, uh, that the United Nations Security Council was set up primarily for the preservation of peace, and yet the world has been pretty much at constant war since. And members of the Security Council have been the major invaders on a number of occasions. When that happens, the Security Council doesn't dare touch the subject. Uh, after three or four generations of concern with development, the gap between the developed and the developing countries is greater than ever. Uh, after programs for, uh, for the elimination of poverty and hunger, we see the absolute numbers of hungry people increasing in the world. We've had some really outstanding international environmental conferences, and yet the CO2 in the atmosphere continues to increase. Uh, there's worry about preserving the, the world health, and yet the classical diseases that we thought were eliminated return. So tuberculosis, cholera, malaria, along with the new de diseases, uh, the variants on flu, uh, HIV, and so forth. Uh, and so you can, you can go down the list. The United Nations the other day acknowledged that the Millennial Development Goals will not be reached. And this, this failure was apparent even before the world economic crisis. <coughs> Agricultural yields in the world have been increasing, uh, but the, pe the, pe the peasants of the world have been impoverished, forced off the land, and sent into cities. <coughs> so the, kind of the question arises, how come the common feature of most major international programs is that they fucked up? Furthermore, that these are not random errors, because when programs fail, you don't see them failing on behalf of the peasants. Now, the benefits of failure tend to be the local oligarchies and the international transnational corporations and the governments that sponsor them. Uh, over recent decades, there's been a great deal of advocacy of democracy. And yet one of the things that's been interesting is the erosion of democracy, of national sovereignty, into the hands of agencies that are not elected, like the World Bank, the Monetary Fund, the uh, Council of Europe. Um, the executive power has been increasing compared to legislative power. And in fact, when at the time of the Iraq War, government leaders, presidents were, pr were praised for overruling and ignoring the will of their populations and even of their legislatures in order to join in in warfare. So we have a systematic pattern uh, and it becomes, even though there's individual explanations for each of the kinds of failure, it's also possible to try to step back and examine overall pattern. 
So yes, in relation to agriculture, we could see the harm caused by industrializing agriculture. And that's come on the agenda in the last few days in relation to the industrialized pig industries. Smithfield Farms, which ran away to Mexico in order to avoid uh, environmental protection controls. Uh, the enormous poultry industry. In each of these cases, small producers and medium-sized producers have been outcompeted and eliminated, replaced by large-scale industrial producers. And for them, cost-cutting is a, a vital issue. And they do this by paying minimum wages, overworking their employees, making use of immigrant labor that doesn't have the rights to protest. But they also do this by cutting corners on environmental regulation, going to where the regulations are not enforced or don't exist, uh, lying about their prote environmental protection. So, so a major public health danger at the present time in relation to infectious disease is the industrialization of agricultural production, particularly of cattle and poultry. <coughs> uh, you can look at the, the relations to pollutions and the non-infectious diseases, and again you see a pattern in which in, uh, industrial development always involves e uh, less environmental protection than our knowledge would recommend. So one strategy would be to examine the particulars of each, each domain where international programs have been unsatisfactory, where the outcomes have been even harmful. And the other then is to step back and see if we can detect an overall pattern. Now before doing that, we have to recognize that there are several different kinds of explanations offered for these massive failures. The first explanation is that we can't solve these problems because it can't be done. And usually this refers back to overpopulation or to what's vaguely referred to as the human condition or the lack of will. A second kind of explanation is that we're doing the best we can and therefore we have to try harder. That governments have committed themselves to international aid but they haven't been coming through on it. So the obvious answer to this is to meet these financial responsibilities, something on the order of 0.7% of the national gross national product going to international aid. And the only ones who've actually met these goals approximately have been the Scandinavian countries. Everywhere else they're far behind, or the aid is tied up in such a way that it's not aid. For instance, the aid takes the form of funding to buy products from the donor country. So in fact, the money cycles back immediately to corporations in the metropolis. Well, there are other kinds of strings attached, those that come through the World Bank. And the, the neoliberal economic development program, which has, first of all, highest priority to payment of debt to the international agencies. In order to do this, balancing the budget and cutting social expenditures. In order to cut social expenditures, the privatization of social service. Uh, so these are, these are the major elements of the, ne the neoliberal program that's imposed as requirements from the uh, World Bank, the IMF. Removal of protection of, lo of local production through the World Trade Organization. So one of the uh, emails that's circulating now on the internet is referring to the present outbreak as the NAFTA flu. It's the NAFTA flu because the North American Free Trade Agreement made it possible for the uh, pork production, Smithfield Farms and others, to move into Mexico and developing countries to evade the environmental protection and then to bring their products uh, freely into the United States out-competing Mexican agriculture. Because one of the ironies of this whole thing is that the two countries which were the cradle of the Green Revolution are now importers of food, Mexico and 